I'm really delighted to be back here in uh, St. Louis. This is an amazing uh, city in so many ways, an amazing part of American history, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about that. An amazing housing stock, right? Uh, uh, you know, still seeing the legacy of the 19th and early 20th century in stone uh, around us. And of course, like many great American cities, it's a city that faces enormous difficulties as well. As we know, you know, this this were, was the list of the 10 largest cities in the United States in 1950. Um, out of those 10, eight of them have 20% or uh, more less population than they did in 1950. Um, St. Louis joins with Cleveland and Detroit in being one of the cities that have lost over 50% of their population since 1950. And I should note, most of what I will tell you today refers to metropolitan areas, the multi-county agglomerations. This is actually about cities. So this is both about the changes across metropolitan areas and of course the suburbanization of population within those, those cities. Um, so St. Louis has moved from having 856,000 people in 1950 to 312,000 today. And the city is now only a sort of, you know, it's a one-tenth of the metropolitan area. It may be the sort of images that people conjure when they think of the St. Louis metropolitan region, but of course it's a smaller and smaller share of that region. Um, metropolitan area per capita GDP is a respectable $56,000, and it's grown by about 6.6% in real terms over the past 15 years. Um, median household income in the city is, of course, much lower. It's $36,000. Uh, mean is higher, suggesting the skewness of incomes that occur within, this, uh, within the city, which is true of so many cities. And of course, perhaps the most troubling number is that 42% of children in the city live in poverty. Although I do want to emphasize one thing about cities and poverty, which is also true about cities and inequality that cities should never apologize for their inequality. Cities attract both rich and poor people with the fact that cities are relatively good places to be rich and relatively good places to be poor. Um, you know, they attract poor people with better social services, with better economic opportunity, often with the ability to get around without owning an abundance of automobiles, right? And cities need to apologize when they're, or cities should be seen as failing, when they fail to turn rich people, to turn poor people into rich people. And so we really should ask about the dynamic of income, about whether or not we're being dynamic enough to take people who start in poverty and make them rich, not whether or not you've just attracted poorer people. That being said, 42% poverty rate uh, for children growing up in the city is still something to watch. Now the education numbers fall in the middle of the pack. So in the case of Detroit, one in eight Detroit adults, 13% or so, have college degrees or more. St. Louis, the numbers are over 30%. So 18.6% have a bachelor's degree, and another 14.4% have an advanced degree. So those numbers are, are respectable, and we see this around us, right? We're in the midst of one of St. Louis's great educational establishments, and there are several of them. And those educational establishments are often the bones on which urban renewal occurs. It's hard to imagine Pittsburgh coming back without Carnegie Mellon, without, without Pitt. Um, now, the other you know, thing that's quite striking about here, and I must say, I, I feel you know, I feel a certain amount of jealousy at the, when I look at the prices of the amazing housing stock in St. Louis. Uh, for the region, uh, the National Association of Realtors give $167,000 as the median sales price, um, and for the city, the census says that the median price is only $120,000. Of course, the vacancy rate is 20%, um, which is certainly not all good, but uh, affordability is an asset as, as well, and it's something to, to think about. Now. I'm going to return to St. Louis in a second, but uh, I'm trying in this talk to focus on both the local and the national. And uh, because in some sense I see cities as being part of, of the way in which we address what Brenda so you know, correctly caused, called one of the great, perhaps the great social dilemma of the 21st century, which is the rise of prime age joblessness in America. You know, when I was born 51 years ago, uh, less than one in 20 prime age males were jobless, right? As had been true in the 60s or the 50s or going back, essentially men in their middle years pretty much all worked. And when they were jobless, they were just between jobs. Today, more than 15% of prime age males are jobless. The, that number has essentially tripled since the mid-1960s. And that's been true for much of the last decade. This is an enormous change in the way that America works. Uh, this is a way of, of looking at it. So the, the blue number is the total share of prime age males. And again, prime age is defined as 25 to 54. And as I just celebrated my 51st birthday last week, I want to say how offensive I find that. Uh, but uh, I'm going to stick with the census definition nonetheless. Um, 
So the total not working rate is this bumpy blue rate which goes up during the Great Recession, comes down a bit. And then this is the share of men, which has been over 10% for much of the past decade, that have been out of work for a year or more. Okay? So this share is not some temporary group of people who are looking for a job. This is a permanent class of American men who are you know, without work and have lost their connection to the labor force. Um, one of the points that I think I want to get across is that it's often, uh, people often act as if inequality is you know, the great challenge for the 21st century. Uh, inequality is not comparable in its problematic nature to joblessness. Right? Earning a little bit more or less has a relatively modest impact on human well-being. Being jobless, being jobless for a year, being jobless for five years has an enormous impact on almost any human, human outcome that you want to pay attention to. I'm showing you one of these, which is just self-reported life satisfaction. And I've cut it up by three different regional cuts for the country, but it really doesn't matter. If you take the country as a whole and you look at those people who are earning more than $50,000, about 2% of men in that category say that they're very unhappy with that life. Go to people earning between 35 and 50, that number rises to 4%. Go to people earning under $35,000 a year, so really relatively low income workers, it goes up to 6%. Go to not working, it careens from 6% to 18%. Okay? An enormous difference in just how miserable people are with their lives. And some of that comes from the sense of worth that we get by going to work, by producing something that somebody values. Some part of it just comes from social connections. Right? Even in low-wage jobs, you look at people working in a McDonald's in a, in a uh, stop by the side of the road, they're interacting with each other, they're joking with each other, they're giving themselves some positive affirmation. Right? You don't get that when you spend, and this is the actual number that out-of-work out men do, you spend five hours a day on average watching television, although computer gaming has recently come to eat in slightly to that time. Right? And that's an important thing about men who are jobless. Women who are jobless, and I, really, I think we have to look at these two issues completely differently. Women who are jobless are doing things like taking care of their kids. They're engaging in a huge amount of work of caring for the community. They're doing the things, quite honestly, that my wife does on a daily basis, which are incredibly valuable. There are some men who do that but very few of them, right? Most of them look like they are you know, spending five hours or more on the, on the, the, on the, television, uh, on the television set. Um, and almost every social outcome that looks problematic, opioid use, suicide, um, divorce rates, all of these are associated in good and repeated statistical studies with joblessness. This is a major problem. And when we take policies that look like they're being good for inequality, like boosting the minimum wage, but that actually discourage work, that say, tell entrepreneurs who would find jobs for people with less skills. Uh, when, we, when we privilege inequality over employment, we're making a big mistake. And, and that's sort of one of the major themes that I've got here. Now, not working in the US has a curious geography. And this is what the non-working rates look like. So uh, one thing I want to particularly bring to your attention is this swath. And the places that are darkest here have 26% or more of prime age males were not working. This region that starts down in Louisiana and Mississippi and heads up all the way to, to northern Michigan, going through Appalachia, of course, is an area that I'll call the Eastern Heartland. It's an area that's the epicenter for this form of social distress in the US. You'll see there are also are areas in the Pacific Northwest that fit in this category, not typically the cities on the eastern seaboard, uh, and also some parts of the southwest as well. But it's really important when we think about coastal cities and flyover states to remember that this is not really the right distinction. Right? Look at the central parts of America. This is not an area in which you have joblessness in the western heartland of the US. This is a very healthy area by lots of, by lots of measures. It's this particular path in the eastern heartland that looks troubled. You'll see that this goes along with other geographies as well. So this is the geography of drug poisoning fatalities, death from typically opioid uh, overdoses. And again, you see this high eastern heartland uh, soaring there. Um, this is what the same geography looked like 30 years ago. So this is 1980. I'm using the same scale in this case. Um, the geography doesn't look that different, but of course it was much lower. You have a few areas, all in Appalachia, where you have more than a quarter of prime age men not working, but all the rest of them are just vastly lower. Okay? And, but it's still true, the places that were relatively high in joblessness in 1980 are still relatively high today. So what I'm showing you here along the x-axis, these are across what are called public use microsample areas. So these are census definitions of geographies within the US. What you're seeing here is joblessness in 1980 and joblessness in 2010. 
right? The share of people who are not working, the share of men who are not working. And what you can see is the, they're very closely aligned, and the coefficient on this relationship is more than one, meaning that it's sort of exploding. Far from a world in which we think places that are somewhat behind are catching up, and that has been true throughout most of American history. Right, throughout most of American history, the places that were a little bit poorer, that were a little bit less advantaged, have experienced faster economic growth, have experienced what we call income convergence. Over the past 35 years, we have seen a remarkable persistence of suffering, particularly as defined by this joblessness measure. Uh, this is what's happened to income convergence. So as I suggested, you know, throughout most of American history, this line would look like a very sharp negative line. Today it looks practically flat. One way of thinking about that sharp negative line is in 1950, Mississippi was the poorest state in the Union. In that year, there were 18 states that had incomes that were more than double the income of Mississippi. Today, Mississippi is still the poorest state in the Union, but there's not a single state in the Union that has an income that is double that in Mississippi. Because throughout most of the past 60 years, capital moved to Mississippi, factories moved there, right? And people who were disadvantaged left and they move to higher income areas. That process seems to have stopped, in part because of the changing nature of work. In a world of an industrial America where it was all about creating factories, it made sense to move factories to low wage areas. In a world in which we are generating ideas or other forms of creativity, it no longer makes that much sense to move to the lower income parts of America. And the second thing that's part of that is the end of the exodus of disadvantaged Americans from disadvantaged places to places with more productivity. So throughout most of the 20th century, we saw things like the great migration of African Americans from Mississippi, Louisiana to productive cities like Detroit and Chicago. Over the past 30 years, the work of Peter Ganong and Danny Shoag tells us that that's really stopped. Migration rates, of course, have fallen substantially. For the 40 years before 1992, Inter-county migration rates in the U.S. were never less than 6%, meaning every year 6% of Americans changed counties. Right? Since the, over the past 10 years, they've never been above 4%. So that's a one-third drop in the migration rates. But even more disturbing is the fact that we no longer disproportionately move, particularly less, less high-income people, less skilled Americans, no longer move to high-income areas. And that's partially about the way that we've changed housing policies. So if you think about Americans, for hundreds of years, we've always been a nation on the move. Right? Think about the farmers of New England in the early 19th century who left the, the crappy, sorry, that's a technical term, the crappy farmland that I see outside my own house in Massachusetts to move to the Ohio River Valley to take advantage of far more productive agricultural farmland. No one told them it was going to be hard to build a house. It was easy to build a house. We had balloon frames that made it easy to, to build, and they had neighbors who would help them with the barn raising. It, then in the, the late 19th century, people came to cities and tenement builders erected hundreds of thousands of units remarkably quickly, keeping housing prices down. In the 1930s, the Okies fled the Dust Bowl and they found space in California. Where's the space in Silicon Valley? Where's the space in, in downtown Manhattan today? Right? We uh, created regulations that make it incredibly difficult to build in the most productive parts of America. And consequently, we've ensured that people can't find opportunity in those areas, and they move to places for different, different regions. Now, in terms of not working, I'm talking mostly about men. This is not, not meant to suggest that there are not women who suffer from the same problems, and I, and I am equally concerned about them. But women not working looks different. This is the geography of it, and you see much more of a north-south divide rather than eastern heartland, western heartland. And historically, women not working is a more complicated, nuanced topic, right? As I mentioned, my wife has, you know, she was a partner in a management consulting firm. She left when we had our third child. There's no sense in which the fact that she devotes a huge amount of time to our kids and to other, you know, local, local causes, that that's a social problem, right? Whether or not, you know, whether or not she, you know, that's a question for her and for families throughout America that make that decision. And it just looks fundamentally different as a social phenomenon. And you see that in the time use surveys, that women who are not working are doing things that look like they're productive things. They also don't look miserable, right? Unlike, unless they have very young kids, in which case they do look miserable. Uh, okay, um, and of course the last, the last geography I want to show you which goes along with this is where the federal government spends money. And again, this is something that again looks like the Eastern Heartland. Uh, the federal government expenditures are moving to the, are disproportionately paid out in those areas that are, are these depressed areas. Now this is part of the background for St. Louis. Part of what's going on is the, from the 800,000 to the 312,000 is suburbanization, but part of it all is this is a troubled region and you are in the heart of the Eastern Heartland. Now, I'm gonna do this division 
Um, the states that I've defined the Eastern Heartland are those states that were admitted to the Union prior to 1840. So it's not a straight geography, it's based on age. Um, and I'm just going to show you a couple of facts splitting it up between Eastern Heartland, Western Heartland, and then I group the coast together. So this is the share of the population, uh, male, males who have been employed in the past 12 years. And as you can see, you know, it's gone down in all three groups, but the Eastern Heartland looks the worst. Right? And whereas 30 years ago, the eastern heartland of the coast looked roughly similar, for the past 20 years, the eastern heartland has looked worse. This is GDP growth. Okay? Again, starting from, from, I've normalized it so they're, they're all the same here. Both the coasts and the western heartland have seen growth. In the coast, it's about increasing GDP per capita. In, the, in part because they don't allow more people to come in because they're highly restrictive on housing. In the Western heartland, it's about increasing the amount of employment. Both of these things are going on. Both lead to GDP growth. By contrast, the Eastern heartland is static. It's not, it's not moving in the same ways. And this may be the most troubling one. Um, some of you may have heard about the work of Angus Deaton and Anne Case showing the, the end of improvements in male mortality over the past 20 years. That phenomenon, above all, is an eastern heartland phenomenon. So these are the trends in uh, prime age male mortality rates. You know, this is the eastern heartland above here. Both the coast and the western heartland look roughly the same. The eastern heartland is an unusual outlier. Um, now. So that's the backdrop, and I think we have to ask ourselves, where does St. Louis fit within this backdrop? So let's just remind ourselves about St. Louis's fairly amazing history. So these are, this is something I pulled off the web, and I, it, it was without copyright, so it's, it's, uh, I'm okay on this. This is just St. Louis's population over the past 170 years. It peaks in the first decades of the 20th century, somewhere around 800,000, and then the rapid runoff. Like most large cities, it has the biggest decrease in the 1970s, which is partially about smaller families over that time period. So this is not just about people leaving homes vacant, although that's part of it, but it's also about the fact that you know, small families now occupy areas where you once had eight, had eight people. St. Louis is, of course, past is you know, uh, incomprehensible without thinking about waterways. Right? Every one of America's largest cities in 1900 was on a major waterway, from the oldest, New York and Boston, typically where the river meets the sea, to the newest, um, Minneapolis, on the northernmost navigable point on the Mississippi River. And of course, that's because of the extraordinary transportation advantages associated with those waterways. Right? In 1816, it cost as much to ship goods 20 miles over land as it did to ship them across the entire Atlantic Ocean. Right? And as such, we, we sat on the eastern coast of the United States, clinging to our Atlantic water, our Atlantic lifeline. Over the course of the 19th century, we built an amazing network that involved both rivers and canals, and cities grew up on pinch points of that network. Like, for example, a pinch point where you might have water, you might have water flowing from the Missouri, from the Illinois River, and even from the northern Mississippi, where you needed smaller boats to travel on those, those shallower rivers, and then you move those goods into the bigger boats. And where did you move them? Where did you change on the boats? Right here in St. Louis, right? It's the natural place to move the goods. And in some sense, the point where the Illinois and the Missouri joined the Mississippi was practically predestined for 19th century greatness. Um, the West Bank, of course, was not English after 1763, and hence it attracted French settlers. And if you want to just look at the historical industries, they're very related to the natural resources that were in this region, right? So in 1851, the, the manufacturing in this area were 19 flour mills, 16 breweries, then as now, and we are in the Bush Auditorium, uh, nine iron foundries, nine sawmills, eight pork houses. Um, like Cincinnati, right, pork precedes beef because, of course, beef requires refrigerated rail cars to move it to the east, whereas for some reason or other, humans have always been fonder of salted pork than salted beef. We were, St. Louis was, of course, second to Cincinnati, which was called America's Porkopolis in the 1820s, but it was an area in which still had plenty of salted pork. And one steamboat yard. And this is a great picture of what St. Louis looked like in, in 1850. And industry followed the waterways. This is true everywhere. Right? This is true of all of America's industrial cities. They started with a transportation cost advantage and industry came next. So New York City dominated by printing, sugar refining, and the garment trade. Right? Sugar refining is there because of the trade with the, with the Caribbean and because you don't want to refine sugar in the 19th century down in the Caribbean because the sh refined sugar crystals would coalesce in a long hot sea voyage north. Chicago, of course, right? the linchpin of a great watery arc that went all the way from New York to New Orleans thanks to the Illinois and Michigan Canal. Uh, a, the city, a city based on beef and stockyards. St. Louis, 
as late as 1939, meatpacking is still a major industry. Footwear, of course, plays an out, a particularly outstanding role in, in this uh, city. Um, apparently, in 1939, one twelfth of all U.S. beer was being made right here in St. Louis. Right? Amazing transportation cost advantages and lead, lead to this uh, distributor network. Steelworks, meatpacking, a classic American industrial powerhouse. Right? This is my Buster Brown shoes image. I just love the dog. The dog looks completely demented. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the shoes, and particularly soles, the soles of shoes that were being produced here, right? Classic industrial, industrial city. But then over the course of the 20th century, transportation costs tumbled. And so these erstwhile advantages that came from access to waterways, access to the rail networks that supplemented them, faded away. And people moved. One way to think about this is that there's a long dance between technology and cities. And I put up this image of an aqueduct because typically people under the age of 22 tend to think that technology was something that was invented in Silicon Valley in 1966. Uh, but of course, technology has been shaping cities for millennia. And there is no more important job of city government than providing city water, clean water, which is why arguably the aqueduct is the most important technology that ever impacted the growth, the growth of cities. In the 19th century, technology was predominantly central meaning it was pulling people into cities. The skyscraper is a classic example. Like many technological breakthroughs, it combines two older ideas. One idea is a steel frame building, which enables those buildings to, to soar cheaply without the need for massive load-bearing walls. The second technology, which is, of course, so crucial for skyscrapers, is the elevator, is Elisha Otis's safety elevator. Right? The skyscraper is not invented by a single person. This is often called the first skyscraper, which is the Chicago Home Insurance Building, uh, and its architect is William LeBaron Jenny. But there's a lively architectural history debate about whether or not this deserves that sobriquet. And the reason is that, in fact, only the, the front two walls have a steel skeleton. The back two have traditional load-bearing walls. And so you know, the debate is, does, does Jenny deserve this credit? What about Louis Sullivan? What about Daniel Burnham? What about Adler? What about Root? What about the great fireproofing engineer, Peter B. White? The reason why I bring this up is it highlights a central element about how creativity works, which is that we always borrow ideas from the people around us. The skyscraper, like pretty much everything else our species has ever done that's worthwhile was a collaborative invention. All of these guys knew each other. They constantly stole ideas from one another. They riffed on each other's creativity. We are intellectual magpies. We become great by borrowing ideas from people around us. This is what cities enable that really matters. And that's how the skyscraper was invented. It's also how Henry Ford managed to create cars, right? Detroit in the 1890s was a cluster of entrepreneurial genius, much like Silicon Valley in the 1960s. It's not just about Ford. It's about you know, the Dodge brothers, the Olds brothers, the Fisher brothers, Ransom E. Olds, Billy Durant in nearby Flint, right? each of whom borrowed ideas from each other, each of whom came together to collaboratively create something quite magical. But the car, unlike the, the, the skyscraper, was, of course, centrifugal. It dispersed people from urban spaces. And that was the story throughout much of the 20th century, that rises in a number of different technologies, entertainment as well as mobility, right? Radios, televisions, that enable people to sit in far-flung houses and enjoy the same pleasures that they would get going to a vaudeville stage. Right? This was the 20th century, and cities suffered accordingly. These are two iconic images from the New York City of my youth. Right? This is um, you know, in. New York in the 1950s, in 1958, the largest industrial cluster in the United States was not automobile production in Detroit. It was garment production in New York City. And that cluster was hammered by globalization and, and declining transportation costs. Hundreds of thousands of jobs lost during a short period of time. Over the same time period, crime spiraled wildly out of control. And the city, trying to deal with social problems that it couldn't possibly afford to handle, lost total control over its budget. It went to President Ford hoping for a bailout. The president, I think, fairly wisely told them uh, he wasn't doing that without major fiscal reforms inside the city. Um, and you know, it really seemed in those days not just as if President Ford, but that history itself was telling the older, colder cities of America to drop dead, that their time had come and gone, that they were dinosaurs. And we'd be looking forward to a future, and you see Jimmy Carter wandering through the wasteland that the South Bronx had become, in which the weeds would come up and reclaim the once proud towers that had soared, that we'd be looking towards a completely post-urban world. A number of things are going on there together. So one part of it is that lower transportation costs enabled Americans to move from places where firms had a productive advantage, perhaps because of access to ports, perhaps because of access to coal mines, like Pittsburgh, to places instead where people wanted to live, 
This was about the rise of the consumer city. And you know, one thing we've learned over the past 100 years is that the, the variable that predicts metropolitan area growth better than any other is January temperature. Now, some part of that is the fact that warmer areas are relatively more pro-business. They tended to be more right-to-work states. And the work of Tom Holmes at the University of Minnesota shows fairly conclusively that having pro-business rules does a great job at attracting industry in post-World War II. Some part of it is about making it easy to build. You don't understand why Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, Phoenix each added a million people since 2000 as metro areas without understanding that they make it very easy to mass produce housing. But let's face it, some part of it is the fact that people prefer California's winters to Boston and St. Louis's winters. And I will say as a New England parent that it shows a terrible lack of character on the part of Americans. <laughs> but there's no denying that it's, that it's out there and it's something we all have to deal with. Along with the move to sun was the move to sprawl. We have always built our urban spaces around the transportation technologies that were dominant in the era in which they were being built. Right? Our older cities are walking cities, then we have streetcar suburbs, we have areas built around the main line of Philadelphia. And so in the 20th century, we rebuilt America around the car. Now that's not surprising. The average commute by car in this country is 24 minutes. The average commute by public transportation is 48 minutes, in part because you have to go and wait for the thing. There's a 15 to 20 minute fixed cost every time you deal with, you deal with it. Um, so it's not surprising, but it did cause a major reinvention of urban space. And I'm showing you the woodlands outside of, of Houston, a sort of more modern car-based city, and of course the start of mass-produced housing in the suburbs, Levittown. Right? Um, the work of Nate, uh, Nate Baum Snow shows that each highway that cut into a metropolitan area core after World War II reduced the central city's population by about 18% relative to the metropolitan area as a whole. Now, the federal government didn't exactly choose a wise strategy to push back at this, right? They followed a Potemkin village strategy with urban rule and with projects like this, which confused the real city for the city skyline. It sort of thought as if, you know, if only we build a, a renaissance tower, and that was privately funded in Detroit, to be fair, uh, as long as we use urban renewal dollars to cause the city to come back, you know, we'll manage to fix things. But the hallmark of declining cities is they have an abundance of structures and infrastructure relative to the level of demand. More than 90% of the homes in Detroit in 1980 were valued considerably below construction costs. It never made sense to subsidize new housing in Detroit or St. Louis for that matter. And it certainly never made sense to build a monorail which was funded courtesy of the federal government after the Federal Highway Aid Act of 1973 to glide over essentially empty streets. You could run a bus at any speed you want want down Detroit's streets. They're empty, right? Why in the world would you put a monorail to go over? It's like, a, it's like the Simpsons episode or something. Um, and, and, you know, but this is what the federal government, clearly some guy in the Ford administration had been to Disney World and thought this was a swell thing that would cause the city to come back. Needless to say, he, it didn't. And the thing that kills me about this is what Detroit needed was better schools for its kids and it needed better safety, right? It needed real investments, but what it did not need was this nonsense. Now, Cars and, and highways killed urban industry. These are a bunch of guys from New York's old garment industry. And so when I started working on these topics in the 1980s, uh, there was a real question as to whether or not information technology, and these were hot information technology items in the 1980s, were going to kill off the idea-oriented industries in cities. Finance, uh, technology, uh, but they didn't. And, you know, this was exactly the thing that the cyber seers and the techno prophets were predicting was that, you know, we would all vacate urban spaces and move to electronic cottages and all dial it in. But that didn't happen, right? And, you know, we see this in places like you know, Google, right, which bought a million and a half square feet in downtown Manhattan, which doesn't disperse its workers, right, even though you think of all the companies in the world that should be able to do long distance communication, it should be them, but instead they say they want everyone close to one another, everyone right on top of each other. I think the reason for this is what globalization and new technologies have done is that they have radically increased the returns to being smart. They've radically increased the returns to innovation. And we are a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. Face-to-face -face contact still matters because as ideas get more complicated, the easier it is for them to get lost in translation. Every one of you who has ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject material. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through to anyone in your audience, okay? And we have evolved over millions of years to having these cues that communicate comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. That's why whenever you're trying to teach something, somebody, something complicated, you want to be next to them. You want to see them. You want to have some idea as to whether or not it's, it's sinking in, right? In a more complica complicated world, face-to-face -face contact still matters. Cities still matter. And, you know, in some sense, this is the Wallace office at Bloomberg, at Bloomberg City Hall, which is based on the Wallace office 
office at Bloomberg LLP, which is based on the Solomon Brothers trading floor. Right? Trading floors are something of an anomaly. Here we have some of the wealthiest people on the planet who in any normal industry would be sitting protected by large desks and executive assistants in large offices. And here they are right on top of each other. Why? Why are they putting up with all that, with all the shouting, all the Michael Lewis's books are to be believed, all the guacamole that's flying over the place with some degree of regularity? Right? Why are they there? Because they want to know what's going on because they need to know what's happening in the markets. They're there because knowledge is more important than space. And that's why some cities have come back. And I think that lies in the model for every form of urban regeneration that you have to imagine, that in the 21st century, cities come back because knowledge is more important than space. Right? It's easy to forget now, but in 1971, two jokers put up a billboard on the highway leaving Seattle, asking the last person to leave the city to please turn out the lights. Because just as no one could imagine, uh, Detroit with a smaller General Motors, no one could imagine uh, Seattle with a smaller Boeing. Right? Uh, and Boeing had been cutting back on the number of jobs. This is before Amazon, before Costco, before S Starbucks, before Microsoft. Right? Seattle did come back. It came back not because of some monorail. It came back because entrepreneurs showed up and started monster businesses that no one had imagined in the 1970s. Now, it's not that the government had nothing to do with that. The government did have something to do with it. And the difference between Seattle and Detroit is that more than one half of Seattle's adults have college degrees. Right? Seattle had an excellent educational infrastructure that was the residue of having those Boeing engineers who wanted their kids to be well educated. Um, this is one way of seeing this. This is population growth between 2000 and 2010 on education across America's counties. You know, as you can see, population growth is much higher in the, the most educated fifth than in the least educated four fifths. This is share of the adults with a college degree in 2000 and per capita GDP. And this is not just about your, about your skills making you more productive. Economists like Jim Rausch and Enrico Moretti have found that this represents human capital externalities. The fact that as the share of adults in your metropolitan area with a college degree goes up by 10%, your wages go up by 10% as well, holding your years of schooling constant. Because having smart people around you helps make you more productive. It's what the great English economist Alfred Marshall was talking about when he wrote that in dense clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air. And having smart, skilled people around you means that you have more of a chance of getting a job from them or selling them something. Right? So skills really are the bedrock on which individual, national, and urban success rests. Now, I'm, skills are of course not just or not, not mainly about what's taught in universities. Almost assuredly the most important skills are the ones that are learned on the streets, in the breakfast table, at the workplace. And I can't think of any skill, any talent that's more important than the ability and inclination to be an entrepreneur. Fifty years ago, the economist Ben Chinitz was comparing New York and Pittsburgh and noting that New York was more resilient than Pittsburgh was even then. He argued that this was a reflection of New York's industrial history, of this garment industry, which had few barriers to entry, few returns to scale. Anyone with a good idea and a couple of sewing machines could get started, and so it was a mother of entrepreneurship. By contrast, Pittsburgh, with its coal mines, had U.S. Steel. And U.S. Steel was a fantastic you know, producer in the short run, but U.S. Steel trained company men, not entrepreneurs. Right? My great-grandfather was a manager in the steel company, and he worked for somebody else his entire life. Right? He, and he trained company men, and I am now in my 26th year working for Harvard. Right? It's, 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 you know, entrepreneurship is something that is taught and that is part of, you know, part of a city's DNA, and it, it is a really, really important one. Now, it's amazing, given how mediocre our measures of entrepreneurship are, uh, that, you know, uh, that they do such a good job of predicting employment growth. So one of the measures we use is the share of employment in startups. The other one is just average establishment size. And what you see here is that employment growth is about four times higher between 1977 and 2010 in those areas with the smallest average establishment sizes than they are in the areas with the largest establishment sizes. So small firms, smart people, and connections to the outside world are the ingredients for urban success in the 21st century. Now, what can you do to engender uh, entrepreneurship at the local level. Well, I'm glad to hear that SLU is in the, is in the top 10 for training entrepreneurship, uh, and that's great. Uh, but training entrepreneurs is actually pretty hard to do, especially from a, government, from a government perspective. But the one thing governments do do is they get in the way, is that they say no to entrepreneurship. And the most important part of the agenda is reducing the regulations that stymie entrepreneurship. And this is not just about sort of overall economic growth, it's also a social justice issue, right? It is outrageous in this country that we regulate the entrepreneurship of poor people so much more tightly than we regulate the entrepreneurship of rich people, right? You can get started with your internet phenomenon in a Harvard, you know, college classroom, and, you know, by the time that the regulators have decided to pay attention, you've got a billion users and you've come close to hacking a couple of elections, okay? Um, it, it, by contrast, if, if you actually want to start a grocery store, 
in a poor part of Boston that sells milk products, and this is literally true, you need 17 permits to get started. Right? That is outrageous. One of my personal pet causes was the cause of food trucks. Now, I think food trucks are a great urban thing, right? Lots of ability for people to be creative, lots of ability to react to areas in which space are, is short. So I've wrote a couple of articles with, with titles like Free the Food Truck. And that got me on an NPR article with this poor woman um, who wanted to start her food truck in Detroit, the Pink Flamingo. Now, uh, you know, the idea that Detroit is saying no to any entrepreneur who wants to get started is amazing to me. Uh, but for 18 months, this poor woman started, wanted to start her food truck. And so we're on the NPR show, and it's the woman, it's the host, it's the ombudsman for the city of Detroit. And they have callers, of course. And for a solid hour, this poor ombudsman gets nothing but, but abuse. You know, the woman abuses him, the host abuses him, I abuse him, every one of the callers abuses him, right? So the guy's been, uh, you know, totally destroyed for, for 60, 60 minutes, and he's just given up. And he says, oh, lady, just go ahead and start your food truck. We'll never catch you. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Um, we're also in a world in which there are a whole bunch of new innovations uh, that have come out of urban entrepreneurship. So the Zipcar story, Zipcar is, is car sharing, that came very much because Robin Chase actually lived in a city and saw what, what the city needed and saw the need for more shared infrastructure around cars. But I want to make a point about sharing more generally, which is that cities have always been about sharing. Right? What is an urban restaurant other than a shared dining room, a shared kitchen? What is an urban park other than a shared backyard? What the technology enables you to do is to share more stuff. So why didn't you have car sharing in New York in the 1970s? Well, that's what your Uber driver would be like. Uh, so that's, that's Robert De Niro. And, you know, I have this image of going to get your zip car in Times Square in 1977, and there'd be like a dead body in the trunk, right? And it'd be really unpleasant. But now with the technology, you can trust your Uber driver, and you can trust that the zip car won't have a dead body, and that's progress. Um, <laughs> taking us back to joblessness, and now, now I'm going to sort of close this, this up. But one of the things we see is that, is that joblessness is really much higher or employment is much lower outside of metropolitan areas than inside metropolitan areas. And part of the reason for this is that if you think about the future for less skilled America, it's almost surely in services. Right? It's very hard to imagine a world in which less skilled people find a large scale future in manufacturing in America. We just do that with machines now and we probably will, will forever. Now this of course creates a particular problem for men, particularly middle aged men, because one thing 51 year old men are not good at doing is being nice to people. Right? Trust me, I know. Okay? Uh, and, and in fact the service industries desperately require you to be nice to someone. Right? You need to smile, you need to be friendly, and you need to not threaten violence if the person you know, treats you badly. I, I know how difficult I would find that. Uh, so so, so I, I empathize, but metro areas, successful metro areas are where you can find service jobs, right? Whereas non-metro areas uh, find it much, much more difficult. Um, within this patchwork of America, I want you to try and understand America as being driven by sort of two things. And I have a very simple factor of economics, a very simple model of economic success, which is basically about rules and schools. So one part, and I've addressed this and I will keep on addressing this, is about education. <laughs> Um, and this shows you the share of college educated men. Lighter means better educated, darker means less educated. And as you can see, the Eastern Heartland is you know, a much less well educated part of America. And that's part of the, the trauma. Partially it reflects an industrial legacy because you had good factory jobs that didn't require schooling. Um, there are different reasons in the, in the Deep South, but you know, education is one part of it. The other part, uh, and this is education of the three regions, so you see the gap between the western heartland and the eastern heartland and the share of the population with the college degree. That does a long way to explain why the western heartland looks so much healthier than the eastern heartland did. Of course, over time, the eastern heartland is caught up, and I don't know if this means that the eastern heartland will pull itself out or the western heartland will be looking at more problems going forward. Um, but it's also about rules. This is a map of corruption as measured by federal cases against local officials. Again, the eastern heartland kind of stands out, doesn't it? Uh, Mississippi and Louisiana routinely vie with each other for being the most corrupt parts of America, right? And quality of government, honest government, effective government is part of how you solve local problems. And the Eastern Heartland is a problem in terms of the effectiveness of government, but it's also a problem in terms of overregulation. So this is one of the, you know, the curses on, on 
uh, finding new jobs or finding new, new employment opportunities is the overregulation of different occupations in the US. So this is state regulation of opticians, so state that requires licensing. Now, this is not about uh, ophthalmologists, right? Or it's not even about, uh, uh, you know, this is about the guys who actually tell you whether or not you should have square lenses or round lenses. This is not anyone who does anything around, you know, eyes and health. You know, I, I can, we can debate how much regulation you need around that. But, you know, there's not a crucial public interest in making sure no one tells you to buy round lenses when you should have square lenses. That's really, that really would be okay. And yet, as you can see, a disproportionate number of states, particularly those in the Eastern Heartland, have embraced regulation of opticians. Right? Anything that stands in the way of people trying new things and experimenting is going to be a barrier to entrepreneurship and a barrier to finding new forms of employment. Now, when you think about the menu that is often out there for fixing declining regions, often the move is for big things, big things that get politicians big headlines. Sports stadia, right? massive investments in a particular region, or better yet, a fancy museum. Right? So this is Bill Bow, which is the, the mother of all success stories in terms of museums. Right? You know, Frank Gehry, uh, you know, f famous museum. Um, it is worthwhile stressing, despite the fact that this is wildly heralded as the great success story in this region, Bill Bow's unemployment rate is still 19%. Okay, so despite the fact that you even get a good museum, which is a crapshoot, right, even with that, it does precious little to solve the unemployment problem. Most of the cases, it looks more like this, you, uh, surely you, you'd heard about the Bilbao Guggenheim. You may not have heard about Sheffield's National Center for Popular Music in the UK, also designed to bring Sheffield back. It closed within the year. Okay, uh, this is what you get with these large attempts to sort of do it with sports studios, do it with convention centers, do it with a variety of sort of large scale pieces of infrastructure that are very poorly targeted towards helping the people to actually get what they need. My mantra is to attract and train smart people and then get out of their way. Okay, none of this is easy. And you know, it's, uh, this is, uh, you know, we're, we're free market, but we're not suggesting that we want a minimal government. Right? We want a government that actually makes sure that education is being provided. Now, of course, that education that's being provided may very well not be provided best by a single public school system. I often think about what would happen if you took a great city and you said, I'm going to have all of the, the food provided by a single public canteen. Right? I'd be turning off all the benefits of competition, all the benefits of innovation in the food industry. Can you imagine what you know, food would be like in Chicago or LA if there was just a single city provision? Well, but that's exactly what we did in the case of schooling. We said all of these things that work wonderful things in cities, right? lots of little firms competing, lots of new people coming up with new ideas, we're going to shut that off in the schooling system. And we're going to make sure that we have one single, single system playing that. That can't be the right answer. And indeed, sort of part of the crucial aspect is to have more competition, have more innovation. And I think it's not just about traditional forms of schooling. It's about vocational training. It's about training in new and interesting things. Right? We need to constantly experiment. Do vocational after school. Do, do it on summers. Right? I'm very big on fast-tracking business formation and fighting over regulation. So one-stop permitting, I think, is absolutely crucial. Uh, I tried to design an entrepreneurship district for Boston three or four years ago, where you would have a, 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 a permitting czar who oversaw that, that structure. There's a place called Devons, Massachusetts, that used to be Fort Devons, that has a single permitting czar who has you know, the ability to grant permits for any new businesses within the area. And the beauty of having one person is that you know if he's screwing up or she's screwing up. Whereas if 17 different entities get to create permits, you never know who's the actual bottleneck. Um, third, and this is important, investing in quality of life that attracts talent, right? In quality of life strategy is uh, employment strategy. So this is something I'm engaged with in, in Boston, which is the possible project which trains, gives young people coming from disadvantaged backgrounds some form of entrepreneurship training. Works on summers, works after school. You know, we need to, it's not that this is the right answer. We need to try things like this. We need to engage in randomized controlled trials to evaluate them. We need to Start with the idea that we, we're not sure what works, but we need to constantly innovate and experiment on this. Um, crime, just a quick point that you know, St. Louis's crime rate is high, Kansas City's is higher, right? We have seen cities fix their crime rates. This is not an insoluble problem. It requires resources, and it requires resources that are smart. Sometimes, you know, so the New York approach was associated with Ray Kelly and, and Bill Bratton, which was a very hard-edged approach. Uh, that can work, although it often creates very sharp divisions between the community and the police force. My own preference is for the, the Boston approach, for a very socially minded policing. And I'll, I'll answer questions about that later. But Ed Davis, who came to prominence after the Boston Marathon, was the king of sort of making friends with the neighborhood, of making sure cops were going out and buying donuts and coffee for everybody, and making sure that you can leverage the police with neighborhood assistance, because that really is crucial. Um, now, just going back to the national employment problem, reversing the war on work. 
For too often, we've ignored the fact that we have public policies that discourage work, right? Uh, Section 8 housing vouchers, effectively a 30% tax on earnings that are created by the funding formula, right? Food stamps, a second 30% tax on earnings. What about disability insurance? After a cliff, you get to keep nothing, right? All of these things sharply deter working. We do have one great policy, which is the earned income tax credit, which promotes working, but that's narrowly targeted. It's targeted primarily for women with, with families. It does very little for the prime age male population. We really have to do something that, that stops this war in work, that does more to encourage working, whether or not that's a stronger employment subsidy or a shift where you allow people to keep more of their earnings, even if they're on disability, and pay them slightly less, perhaps, if they don't earn anything. Right? We need to understand that there is a cost to raising minimum wages. That, you know, there's also a social justice issue associated with minimum wages. Every time we ask, you know, we just raise the minimum wage, we're asking the people who are customers of these companies to bear some part of the cost. Why is it right that the customers of Walmart or McDonald's should be paying the cost for whatever social justice thing you're doing with the minimum wage? Whatever we think we, sh we should be doing, presumably all of us have an obligation, and there should be an employment subsidy that's funded by everybody if we think we should have it at all. And I think if all of the sort of, you know, fun ideas that have come out of Silicon Valley in recent years, the one that I'm most troubled by is universal basic income. Now, an idea that what we're going to respond to technology by just making sure that 30% of America is on the dole in perpetuity feels like it's absolutely soul killing to me. It feels like it is so far from recognizing that a sense of self doesn't come from collecting a check. It comes from actually doing something that people value. And uh, you know, I, I, would, I would banish this idea from our lexicon and instead recognize that every unemployed American is a failure of entrepreneurial imagination. And the fact that we are not employing enough people means that we haven't made that entrepreneurship pay off. We put too many barriers in the way of it and not done enough to promote it. And I think as I look forward to the future, right, um, I think it's really crucial that we want to sort of push people more towards working. We want to make work pay and we want to make sure that we don't discourage uh, don't, don't discourage those jobs. Now, I just want to end on one final point on this, which is it's easy to be depressed about 15% prime age males that are jobless. It may even be easy to be depressed about a 20% vacancy rate in St. Louis. I think there's a lot that's great in this city, and I think if I look at the track record of humanity over the last 3,000 years in urban spaces, it's phenomenal. We're great at coming up with ideas especially when we learn from one another, when we're connected with one another, when we don't have government policies that artificially limit us, but that we do have government policies that enable young kids to learn and to find a better future. We need to make sure that we have sensible policies that encourage innovation and competition in schooling. We need to make sure that we have rules about entrepreneurship that don't stymie them. And we need to make sure that we have space for humanity in cities to solve our own problems. And I guess I continue to be optimistic and, and sure that we will. So I think I'm, I'm close to out of time, but maybe we have a couple of, couple of seconds for questions. This is a share of the population, right? And the drug problem either, you know, can come before or can come afterwards, right? So, so there certainly are a bunch of, uh, some fraction of this population. No one's exactly sure what, what fraction, which is hard to imagine that you're ever going to fix their issue, right? So that's, that's a, but there are people, new people who are entering to this population all the time. People have been laid off, people who are not ex-convicts, people who are, you know, just deciding to live on their, I mean, 30% of the, of the jobless prime age males live with their parents live on the parents' couches. Um, you know, this is not a population we can write off. So is, is this a problem? Is there also a problem with like part of America losing its way morally? Unquestionably, right? And it requires, in many of these cases, it requires more than, you know, employment subsidies and better policies towards business regulation to heal that. And I, I don't mean to push back on that. But there is some fraction of the population. I mean, you know, work of Magnus Mogstad looked at disabled workers in, in Norway who also have problems of this kind, right? And they find that when you let the workers keep some fraction of their earnings, they start working, right? They're on disability, but they start, they start actually collecting some. They figure out some way to use their skills. So I, I, don't, I don't, you know, mean to, to say that there aren't issues of the form that you, that you raise, but I do think that sounder policies towards both, you know, uh, the way that we've structured our social welfare system and also the way that we put barriers in the way of people working wouldn't also make a difference. But is it going to make all the difference? No, of course not. Of course not. Um, all of these industrial cities were just too large relative to the level of demand, right? So you, you built for a city of 850,000 people in 1950, and it was built around industries that were just never going to last in the, in the city. So the city needed to right size itself, right? And, and that's, that's where we are. In some sense, I use the phrase in my book, shrinking to greatness, right? That's part of what had to happen in St. Louis's case. It needed, it needed to be smaller. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting smaller. It's not like the right answer is that St. Louis should say, boy, unless we manage to get 850,000 people living within the city limits, we're never going to succeed, right? That's not the right answer. The question is, are you providing 
providing good educational experiences for your kids? Are you providing good opportunities for, for you know, people who want to start businesses or find jobs within, within there? And uh, you know, a part of that involves attracting talent. Now, what do I think the right answer for that? In part, it involves using your historical assets which are you know, fairly considerable. I mean, you have, a, you have a great architectural stock in this, in this city, right? You have great restaurants, you have great cultural heritage. I mean, there's lots of things which are, which are great and, and you know, great educational institutions. Um, so it's working off of that, but then it's recognizing that like, the right answer isn't gonna be a larger convention center. Right? It's recognizing that what, what you need is to make sure that you, you know, allow entrepreneurs to, keep, you know, to, to want to work here. You need to make sure that you, know, you don't pay extra, let's say just hypothetically, an extra earnings tax by locating in St. Louis rather than moving right outside its borders. Right? That's, that's something to, to think about. You need to make sure that the rules that are around entrepreneurship are friendly, not, not hostile. Um, and you know, taking advantage of what's, what's, you know, what are the long run assets of the city. You know, Pittsburgh is not a terrible model on this. I mean, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh you know, in 1960, Pittsburgh looked like worse, a worse disaster than any of these other cities did. And Pittsburgh, you know, it's not, it's not San Francisco right now, but Pittsburgh kind of looks okay right now. I mean, it's sort of in the middle of, in the middle of the pack. And I think that's the sort of right, right model. I think it is really important. Just once I want to see a big city mayor say, yeah, my city lost 100,000 people during my tenure, but I educated those kids superbly and they found great jobs in Austin, right? They found great jobs in Atlanta, because that's not at all bad either, right? So just, you know, yes, sir. That's the last question. Okay. <laughs>